Welcome back to the AI Weekly Update series from Henry AI Labs of the week of May 26th, 2021. Probably the most viral and uh, popular news that came out this week is measuring code challenge competence with apps. So what this is, is they're uh, doing deep learning, language modeling, natural language processing, but they're moving from text corpora to code data sets. So data sets that contain Python code, JavaScript code, Java code, and they're testing it for applications like say, uh, auto completion that are built into IDEs. And this paper particularly is reporting that the, when they use transfer learning, they're improving the usage rate of, I think they report about 6.6% is the increase of how often people uh, take this auto completion suggestion as they improve the model with transfer learning. So, but this paper, what's really exciting about it is they're evaluating the Python code on test cases. In addition to that, they're also using natural language descriptions of the problem. So it's a uh, interview style coding prompt where you have things like, uh, you know, say match a subsequence string within the string, or, uh, you know, maybe like a construct a binary tree or these kind of problems and it's being evaluated on the test case rather than say the B L E U blue kind of automated metric of matching this kind of uh, text generation with some kind of ground truth, but it's being evaluated on test cases, which is really interesting. So these are really interesting advances in deep learning with code data. So then in the domain of understanding deep learning itself, I really like this paper, the simplicity bias. So what the authors are referencing the, as the simplicity bias is that stochastic gradient descent has this tendency to try to find the easiest solution to, you know, ameliorate the loss function and improve upon the loss and so it'll find these simple patterns where it can rather than looking at complex patterns that might uh, generalize better so the idea of the paper is to train an ensemble and not for the sake of having a better inference where you have say 10 different neural networks and you aggregate their predictions so that you have this weighted voting of the final prediction but rather the ensemble is used to regularize the gradients and make sure they point in different directions such that it's going to learn a more complex pattern rather than this simplicity bias towards a simple pattern the next interesting paper in this domain of understanding deep learning and some of the popular layers and tools that have been used is rethinking batch and batch norm, particularly taking apart this problem of using exponential moving average to have an estimate of the scale and shift parameters for the entire population of data by using this aggregation of the mini batches and some problems that arise due to that. Then we'll look at the new advances in self-supervised learning. Contrastive learning and language modeling in particular continue to make huge advances every week or huge advances in the understanding of these algorithms and the methodology towards uh, conducting this research. So the first of which is divide and contrast self-supervised learning from uncurated data. And the high level idea is that when you're testing out algorithms like SimCLR, MoCo, BYOL on real, true, unlabeled in the wild data, they have this heavy tail distribution of the classes. So compared to ImageNet where you have a thousand classes and something surprising about the paper is they say that if you cluster canine related classes like dogs, wolves, and that kind of thing, that that makes up 130 of the ImageNet classes. So I'm not sure if that was correct, but that is something that's in the paper. But so basically the idea is that these ImageNet classes, they have this local, uh, the negatives are related to each other. So you have this fine grained discriminative features that are learned by having relevant local subsets. So in order to achieve that kind of benefit in real in the wild data where you have this heavy tail distribution of classes, they're gonna cluster the representations and they're gonna apply expert models and then use knowledge distillation where you train a local expert on these clusters that are, have been clustered by using the representation in this iterative process of learning representations from unlabeled data. So we'll get into more details of exactly how this works later in the video. Then we're looking at true few shot learning with language models. A very popular paper right now that is, you know, kind of challenging GPT-3 and saying that the way that it's being evaluated for few-shot learning is disingenuous and it's not really true to the definition of this few-shot learning problem. So later on in the video, we'll look at uh, this new flute algorithm, a way of using conditional batch norm for, say, the meta da uh, data set. The meta data set is a collection of data sets like uh, OmniGlot and then also uh, constructions of, say, ImageNet that are, have been constructed for this task of uh, learning classification from, say, four examples or something like that. That's kind of the idea. So really taking apart this definition of few shot learning and understanding exactly what it is and why GPT-3 uses this validation set to tune its hyperparameters and particularly to tune the prompts. The prompts are the like the in context learning that goes in the input and that heavily influences the final result with how they report few shot learning. Then we'll look at Kelm integrating knowledge graphs and language model uh, pre-training corpora. Knowledge graphs are one of the, you know, one of the emerging, I not emer it's an old idea, but it's gaining popularity recently as well as trying to integrate these knowledge graphs with this, say, knowledge intensive tasks like the KILT benchmark or using these uh, biomedical graphs and all these kinds of things and trying to integrate this uh, factual knowledge into language models. So this is one idea of trying to 
uh, turn these into uh, text sequences so that you can keep applying predict the masked out token with this kind of objective of integrating knowledge graph structured information. Then we'll look at our uh, large pre-trained language models uniformly better, particularly looking at as you scale it up, does it really improve performance on every single instance or just the population accuracy itself. Next up, we'll look at the latest coverage on neural architectures. The last time I left off doing these weekly update series videos, uh, the vision transformer model was exploding. Every week, uh, there were say like eight to 10 papers of people finding these slight variations to the vision transformer design that had these miscellaneous kind of improvements, whether it was uh, like sample efficiency improvements, robustness on say the ImageNet C set, or just overall top one ImageNet accuracy improvements. There were a flood of people trying to find these little ways to improve the vision transformer. And then came this MLP mixer paper, uh, now GMLP, the gated MLPs, pay attention to the multilayer perception architectures. And we'll also look at the Keras code example implementation of these modern MLP models. They're not like exactly equivalent to just stacking together uh, dense layers. They have, you know, the skip connections and normalizations. And then they have this, uh, particularly this paper has this uh, spatial projection, these gating units. So it's not exactly like just stacking together feed forward layers, but it is showing that, uh, you know, maybe architecture design isn't as important as, as originally thought, which is, you know, definitely a surprising idea. The next paper is are convolutional neural networks or transformers more like human vision? Uh, kind of going back to this idea of say the shape or the texture bias, we have data sets like stylized ImageNet, which is supposed to uh, show that it's uh, overfitting to texture compared to shape bias, and that uh, human vision is more like shape bias. So here's another paper uh, looking at this kind of idea and maybe back to this theme of neural architectures and trying to take apart whether these priors that we're building into the architectures are uh, really influential on the model, or if it's really just a matter of scaling it up and more interest that comes with the idea of having something new with the architecture or some idea like that, I'm really not sure. Then we'll look at uh, few shot learning, uh, back to this true few shot learning with language models, this paper, learning a universal template for few shot data set generalization, uh, more true to this kind of branch of research and studying data sets like OmniGlot and MetaData set. Particularly what they're using is a uh, conditional batch normalization thing. So batch normalization, back to, as we'll go deeper into this paper, rethinking batch and batch norm. Batch normalization has these two parameters, uh, the scale and shift parameters, where you have the mean and the variance parameters that are used to adjust the features. And this can be done, say, like uh, on each of the spatial locations of feature planes or the channel axis, these kinds of ideas. And uh, there's also a really great paper uh, called Training Batch Norm and Only Batch Norm. Jonathan Frankel is one of the authors of this paper that shows just how powerful these batch normalization parameters are on overall influencing the accuracy of the network. So this is looking to achieve few shot learning by controlling these batch normalization parameters and learning a particular uh, set of conditional batch normalization parameters for each of the data sets as it's going to generalize to this case of having to uh, quickly assemble classes. And particularly this metadata set, it's not just OmniGlot where you have a new configuration of uh, like alphabet characters and you have to learn some new alphabet from them, but you haven't even seen the data set yet as well. So a pretty interesting extension to that kind of few shot learning setting. True to this uh, true few shot learning with language models, really taking apart what it means to do few shot learning and this definition of few shot learning. So next up is Path Dreamer, a world model for indoor navigation. I haven't read too much and don't know exactly how this algorithm works, but this idea of world models where we're learning these generative models that can uh, you know, model sequence trajectories of state action transitions. In this case, doing things like vision language navigation through say uh, like these indoor uh, mapped out house diagrams and ideas like this. Path Dreamer is able to look at one room of a house and then construct a world model of what the layout of the entire house might be. And this is a pretty interesting idea. I think it has all sorts of different mechanisms like say, uh, like a point cloud representation of the space and ideas like this that we'll get into later in the video. And then the Keras code example series continues to pump out these really great tutorials and something that I really wish I had uh, when I first started learning Keras and learning how to you know, do deep learning code. We have image classification with the modern MLP models, the MLP mixer, GMLP, uh, and then the uh, something else, the FN net, something like that that I'm not exactly sure. And then we even have node classification with graph neural networks. Uh, say, I think it takes a citation network and you're predicting the topic of the paper based on the citations of the paper. And overall, this field of graph neural networks is really exciting. And here's an example in Keras, if you're curious about this and maybe have a graph data set yourself, for yourself, but you don't know uh, really how to set this kind of problem up in Keras. Uh, then we'll look at uh, Google's release, the Biomed Explorer built on top of the Cord19 data set. Uh, maybe you've seen, uh, I've written a paper on deep learning applications for uh, COVID-19, and one of the most exciting things, in my opinion, are these scientific literature mining systems. So CORD-19 is a data set uh, curated mostly by the Allen Institute, I believe, and they have uh, 
probably over 150,000 papers on uh, COVID-19 and related uh, topics. So the idea that you know one individual person could read all or a lab could read all these papers is ridiculous. So that's kind of the motivation I think behind these information mining tools, and then particularly building it on top of these papers with things like uh, these co-search is a really great paper from Salesforce researchers that kind of outlines the overall idea of having these uh, vector encoding indexes that are retrieved as input to say re-ranking models or question answering summarization and this kind of complex systems that you can build on top of these data sets that I think is really exciting. So we'll have a quick look at this uh, Biomed Explorer from Google. And then we have a new data set, uh, Book Summaries, a collection of data sets for long form uh, narrative summarization, which really is going to stress this uh, long range modeling. We've seen things like long range arena and overall trying to get these input lengths larger than 512 tokens. And here's another data set that will help uh, make progress on these kind of goals. In my opinion, this is the biggest news update in deep learning this week. And I really think it ranks up there with things like Dolly, Clip, you know, AlphaFold 2 as something that is going to be uh, really impactful. So this paper is titled Measuring Coding Challenge Competence with Apps. And basically the idea, we've seen these papers that take in Python code, say Code Search Net, or translate between programming languages, for, so say from Java to C++ to Python. We've seen a lot of different papers that operate with deep learning code, but particularly this is showing what I think to be a generalization of the problem that makes it uh, much more challenging. So as you see, it's it takes in a natural language description of say, uh, like a hacker rank, leak code style uh, programming problem, and then it learns to generate Python code. And this code doesn't need to be evaluated with uh, like matching metrics, like say the blue score, BLEU score, as used to say match these gold summaries, which are the annotated ground truths with generated code in order to, you know, try to have the model like exactly line, align the generation with the human written ground truth. Rather, it's being evaluated with test cases. So they describe having over 10,000 problems. They do have ground truths. Uh, if I can find the exact uh, numbers, it's somewhere around here. So they have over 130,000 uh, test cases. To for each of these 10,000, for overall the 10,000 problems, and they have 230,000 human written solutions. So uh, in the last weekly update video, uh, we looked at the GPT uh, Neo notebook, how to use uh, GPT Neo. It's an open source uh, 2.7 billion language model trained on this, the pile data set of 800 gigabytes of text. And there's a formal paper that describes this uh, data set. And so GPT Neo can pass approximately 15% of the introductory problem. So it's not the viral headline of AlphaFold 2 yet because it's not exactly you know solving this all the way, but just that it's making progress on this I think is very impactful and you know overall this is going to be a really interesting thing to uh, keep an eye on is progress in the space of using deep learning to write code and this kind of recursive improvement of deep learning that maybe even writes deep learning code like Keras or PyTorch and overall this kind of thing of building these more intelligent coding tools I think should be a very impactful. Uh, application of deep learning. So here's another example of a problem, a natural language description of this kind of coding task, and then the generated Python code. So overall, I think this is really amazing. And in my opinion, probably the biggest uh, mind blowing update to AI and deep learning this week. So here are a couple other papers to uh, get a better sense of this space. So code auto completion is one of the uh, biggest kind of applications I think of this. Uh, I originally was introduced to it. Uh, Yannick Kilcher was making videos on uh, tab nine. And I think tab nine is doing is solving this problem of code auto completion. So as you can see in this uh, diagram, you are writing this PyTorch code and then you have loss equals C and then it's saying uh, criterion is probably what you want to finish this with and you just hit tab and then you have criterion and you keep writing your code and so the overall uh, takeaway from this paper is that as they do this kind of uh, transfer learning by having more unsupervised pre-training and they're going to improve the accuracy on their automated metrics but then when they uh, deploy it into the into real world users with a b testing they find that improving the model with additional pre-training transfer learning from language models improves the auto completion usage by 6.6 percent so really interesting to see the improving of this kind of tool and the other paper is deep debug fixing python bugs using stack traces back translation and code skeletons and kind of one thing that i thought really interesting about this paper uh, other than you see this uh, final line of how quickly can it fix bugs in code 68% of the time, then once it sees the stack trace, 75%. So that's the performance of the model right now and on maybe like arbitrarily broken code. But I think this kind of way of uh, bootstrapping data collection is a very interesting part of this paper. They use reversed uh, commits in order to build up this data set. And this is showing the flow of these stages of training from these uh, different objectives. Say, first you train on English data, 
that like hit like Wikipedia English and then uh, training with Python code, like just a raw dump of GitHub Python code that you're just language modeling, predicting masked out uh, tokens. And then you have say more fine grained supervised learning in this overall pipeline of building these models that operate on code data. This next paper is titled Evading the Simplicity Bias, Training a Diverse Set of Models Discovers Solutions with Superior Out of Distribution Generalization. And I would bucket this paper in a group with say, uh, Deep Double Descent, The Lottery Ticket Hypothesis, What's Hidden in a Randomly Weighted Neural Network, in the sense that I think this paper really offers a great insight into how these deep neural networks work. So the high level overview is, say you have these bird images, and again, when these are represented as image pixel grids, they have these extremely high frequency patterns in this height by width by RGB input tensor. And it's gonna probably try to find these patterns in the background that are just easier to classify the image width than looking at these high level semantic concepts of say tail, claws, and uh, beak of a bird and using that kind of idea to classify it as a bird. Rather, it's gonna look at these really high frequency patterns in the pixel data that we couldn't even possibly understand. But as you're passing in these numeric patterns, that's the kind of thing that stochastic gradient descent is gonna be biased towards. So, uh, so that's not the overall, that's the kind of the motivation behind this problem is that it has a simplicity bias where it's easier to solve these tasks by looking for patterns in the backgrounds and stuff like that. So rather than say a data augmentation scheme where you use the same kind of idea of how you have this out of distribution test set that randomizes the background to try to uh, you know not overfit to the background you could maybe just use this as a data augmentation scheme where you just uh, and we've seen papers that do this uh, at least a couple papers try to randomize this background or just set it all to be zeros black static to try to not overfit to the background but this is the idea of how you're testing it but so instead of trying to use data augmentation so it doesn't look at the background we're gonna be training an ensemble and then regularizing the gradients so they point in different directions such that uh, by pointing in different directions, they're gonna have to look for different patterns in the data in order to you know, learn different patterns for the sake of learning to solve the training task and then hopefully generalizing to the test set or however the distribution shifts. So, and then you would evaluate it with the test set. So overall, I think this idea is really interesting of training an ensemble, forcing the gradients to point in different directions to learn different patterns from the data, and then using this overall strategy to overcome this simplicity bias, rather than say uh, like a data augmentation that is randomizing the background or some solution like that. Next up, we're rethinking batch and batch normalization. So batch normalization is kind of like a dark art of deep, uh, deep learning and training deep neural networks, where we compute these mean and variance parameters across the batch, and we have this overall estimate of the mean and variance of intermediate activations of intermediate layers of these neural networks that are these sequential processing machines, and we're using that to normalize the activations through each individual instance that runs through our neural network. So we have the current, so say you have one image and on you're doing batch normalization across the spatial axis and at position ij like 10 15 some random index position of the intermediate feature plane of your deep neural network you're going to subtract it by the mean of the activations at this 10 15 location throughout or say 10 15 3 to represent that it's like the third channel plane of your set of intermediate feature planes of this mini batch of data you're going to subtract it by the mean and then divide it by the variance squared plus some kind of E, I don't know exactly what that E does, probably just some constant value, hyperparameter of the algorithm, and you use that to normalize the feature value. So the authors are highlighting that the com computation of these uh, mean variance parameters depends enormously on what is known as the batch. So how you order these batches, the size of the batches, these different ideas can really influence how well batch normalization works. So the first idea is using the whole population as a batch compared to exponential moving average. So exponential moving average is usually what's used where you have this running estimate of the mean and variance by weighting the most recent uh, mini batch estimate with the, you know, what you've learned so far from however many mini batches you've seen during training. So this is showing the difference between the EMA mean and then 100 samples of the batch mean compared to what they introduce as precise batch normalization where in precise BN, what you do is you, um, they show exactly the algorithm, you uh, completely freeze the model and then you pass the entire data set through. So you have the exact mean and variance parameters for the data set at the current uh, step of your model. And we know that you only would really need to do this once every epoch. So it's not really like a massive uh, bottleneck in training. So they go on to show things like, um, you know, how this scales with respect to the size of the batch and how, uh, how stable it is with these different ways of estimating it with uh, respect to which parameters you're using. Uh, then they look into ideas like domain shift, uh, this idea of uh, yeah, the size of the batch and then domain shift. 
overall, and then leakage between examples in the mini batch. Overall, taking apart all these really fine grained details of batch randomization and seeing how it's influencing the final performance. Next up is my second favorite paper from the week, with the first being uh, apps divide and contrast self supervised learning from uncurated data. So, the authors are highlighting that when we're testing these contrastive learning algorithms like SimCLR and MoCo on the true setting for self supervised learning, which is supposed to be you know, uncurated, unlabeled data that you'd say just get from the internet or you know, whatever data source, but you don't have to really curate it, as in the sense of how ImageNet classes have this kind of what they describe as local consistency. So they describe how within an ImageNet class, uh, it, within a sampled batch for contrastive learning, you'd say have uh, dogs versus wolves versus foxes, that kind of fine-grained information within the t uh, classes that helps with this kind of contrastive learning. So the overall algorithm to improve this and achieve this local consistency in unlabeled data is to have this three-stage process. So the first stage is to train some kind of base self-supervised learning. This could be any kind of way of representation learning. You could be you know, rotating images and predicting the rotation angle. You could be doing mass language modeling. You could do auto encoders, whatever it is to learn some kind of representation of the data, or you could just get right to contrastive learning with data augmentation views. So once you have this representation, now you're going to do k-means clustering to assign these local subsets that should have semantically meaningful uh, classes because of their similarity in the original representation space. So once you have these uh, k clusters, now you're going to train a contrastive learning model on each of the clusters. So the blue dots are mapped to this blue subset. This is going to train one expert model that's trained with this MoClear algorithm. MoClear being basically identical to SimClear and uh, BYL, MoCo, really, you know, very fine grained differences in the architecture between these different variances. So you train this MoClear model, basically the same idea again. So you're going to have one different expert model, and then you're going to have this knowledge distillation process. And the knowledge distillation process is where uh, the overall model that you end up reporting, the final representation, is going to try to predict the, is going to have a regression loss, where it's going to try to predict the representation of each of these expert models, whichever expert model is selected. So say you sampled and in your mini batch, you have orange, green, purple, or two purples. You're going to use uh, the first orange one, the, this expert model to match this regression loss. Then the purple model will match both of the two sampled purple K cluster, that, so it has an ID for the cluster, which is K. So you sample the purple one and then green, so so on. So that's the overall algorithm of having this process of uh, clustering expert models, distillation into one model by predicting with a regression loss. And then in the end, they show how, you know, as most of these papers do, how it improves over the other algorithms. They control for things like how many overall epochs you're doing. So compared to, so because you have this intermediate step of initial training, training expert models, distillation, you compare it with, say, just, uh, so 3,000 of just running SimClear compared to these intermediate stages. And then overall, they show how it uh, continues to improve with this algorithm. So I thought it was a really clever idea for trying to improve upon these contrastive self-supervised learning algorithms. Next up, we're challenging the integrity or more so, say, the experimental methodology behind how GPT-3 is reporting few-shot learning performance. So this paper titled uh, True Few-Shot Learning or I think the full title is something like that. I haven't memorized it. Uh, and this tweet thread from Ethan Perez really describes it well and how exactly they are highlighting this uh, true few shot learning setting. So they start by highlighting that uh, the hyperparameter tuning, particularly the prompting. So GPT-3 takes in prompts in the form of in-context learning where you give it examples of the task as well as some kind of description of the task. And it uses that to, as a part of the input uh, sequence to make inferences about uh, new instances and thus perform classification with the few shot being the demonstrations from that uh, prompt. But what they're showing is that they're tuning those examples heavily through a large validation set and it's not really true few shot learning in the sense that you really only have say four labeled examples in the true formulation of this few shot learning problem similar to say uh, like how OmniGlot or metadata set how these kind of data sets are designed to uh, test few shot learning so the authors find that when you just use things like cross validation or minimum description length to select the optimal prompts or hyperparameters without actually using some held out validation set it doesn't perform nearly as well as tuning with a large validation set does. Next up, the Google AI blog has a blog post describing Kelm integrating knowledge graphs with language model pre-training corpora. So if you haven't heard of knowledge graphs before, they contain these entity relation entity tuples that describe say this uh, uh, nonprofit organization, instance of nonprofit organization, when was it created is inception 2012. So knowledge graphs contain this kind of explicitly structured factual information and there's been a push in natural language processing to try to see how we can uh, integrate knowledge graphs into say uh, language models or these kind of like 
augmented language models with retrieval augmented generation or RAM or these kind of ideas to make it uh, factually consistent with things like the kilt benchmark or overall just uh, not hallucinating these facts when you're doing text generation. So the idea of this paper is to form natural language sequences automatically from knowledge graph tuples and then just so you concatenate it, verbalize it, turn it into a text sequence and then just append to the uh, pipeline of training these language models so it gets verbalized into these sequences which are added to the corpora and then you language model these uh, factually intensive uh, sequences that are derived from knowledge graphs and then they show how this improves performance on the natural questions and the web questions benchmarks also using the realm retrieval augmented model so overall an extension to these language models to make them better at uh, knowledge intensive or these like factual tasks for language processing so more on the investigation of language models this paper titled are large pre-trained language models uniformly better comparing performance at the instance level is showing that even though you may scale up BERT from say 100 million parameters to 300 million and so on making it larger and larger it is overall improving performance on the population but not necessarily each individual example so it may uh, suddenly be misclassifying one of these previous examples even though overall it's performing better on the entire data set so they're uh, breaking down this kind of idea and exactly how they uncover this but overall I think the high level takeaway is that it's very interesting that uh, maybe the representations learned by the larger models are so much different that it's flipping these predictions that were previously correct with smaller models. Back to the discussion of neural architectures and the rapidly evolving understanding of these models from the new development of attention layers and then bringing attention layers and transformers to vision with the vision transformers and now the MLP mixer and this paper, the gated MLP, showing that uh, you know even multi-layer perceptron models perform well, really the benefit being just scale it up. So they do have one line that summarizes this great where they basically say, that yeah, the transformer is better at uh, tasks like natural language inference where you have a cross attention over two sequences. But if we just increase the MLP, the GMLP model by 3x, they're equal again. So it's showing that really capacity is still the thing that is uh, pushing forward progress in this kind of architecture, not necessarily the attention layer itself. And maybe attention isn't all you need, that these kind of like themes have been what's, you know, say on Twitter lately in this kind of conversation. So Overall, it has this channel projection, projection spatial projection, and um, the gating layer. So this is overall uh, algorithm of how they're splitting across. They have these intermediate uh, height by width uh, tensors. They're splitting across the height by width by channel, splitting across the uh, channel axis, then projecting this. Uh, so they split it across the channel. They blow up the size of the V in the split, and then they have the dot product again with the U from the original split. In this kind of diagram and later on we'll look at this uh, keras code example that is uh, getting de more detailed into exactly how it's implemented so no need to look at this really because you can see exactly how it's implemented in keras code and have it for yourself if you want to experiment with this but so they uh, take apart the different size constructions of the model and you see this really great uh, table that compares many of these different uh, deep learning architectures for ImageNet. We have the ResNet 152, EfficientNet, Vision Transformer, the Data Efficient Image Transformer with the distillation from the CNN to the uh, Vision Transformer. And then we have the MLP Mixer, uh, Res MLP, which I'm not familiar with, and then this new GMLP showing the ImageNet top 1% accuracy, all really roughly uh, similar based on size as well size is like a huge as you see the parameters millions uh, the computation in each of the models uh, this is you know hugely correlated with how well they perform in this table overall showing that they're kind of about the same uh, with this normalization free net having or these two models but overall just showing a comparison of this I haven't really looked at this as you can tell if you <laughs> but if you want to look more into it here's a table of it uh, then they take apart different uh, constructions of the GMOP model particularly uh, then moving on to language tasks, comparing it with BERT and transformers, showing that you can achieve the same perplexity for language modeling with this MLP design. Uh, and then, you know, showing the benefits of scale, uh, different ablations on the different uh, tasks from language modeling to sentiment classification, or I think this might be a natural language inference task or something like that. And then MNLI natural language inference task. And then adding this kind of tiny attention thing to the model, the uh, AMLP with attention added to the MLP and overall taking part of this kind of new model and overall showing this evolution in designing neural architectures 
overall, in my opinion, a very confusing space and I don't have a great uh, grip of it, but here's the latest paper, pay attention to MLPs. So digging deeper into neural architectures and looking at the inductive biases between these weight sharing in the local filters and convolutional neural networks compared to the attention layers in the transformer neural networks, this paper is exploring are convolutional neural networks or transformers more like human vision. So first they describe how they have this error consistency analysis, this Cohen's K, to basically make sure that it's not just accounting for chance with respect to the different errors, overall looking at this error overlap and so on to make this comparison of human misclassifications with the vision, transform or the vision transformer and convolutional neural networks. So overall, they're showing in this plot that the vision transformer does have more of the shape bias compared to the texture bias. And this is measured by using this SIN stylized image net data set. So it's common to now, you're seeing more and more of these OOD sets particularly designed to test these kinds of things. So stylized ImageNet is using neural style transfer to transfer the style between different images in the ImageNet data set such that you can uh, you know, separate texture and shape because you separate texture by uh, randomizing it through neural style transfer between all the different images in the data set such that only shape is remaining. And you see the errors that are made once these uh, images have been stylized like this, I guess. So overall, uh, they then show the you know fine tuning with data augmentation to try to uh, deliberately increase the bias and how that uh, impacts the performance. And this plot showing the difference between the vision transformer in yellow and then the ResNet convolutional architecture in blue, comparing the shape bias, which is uh, you know I'm not sure exactly how they measure this really. And then the red line is the overall ImageNet accuracy, uh, and it seems like uh, you know the vision transformer that they're testing particularly is a lot stronger than the ResNet given the accuracy. But so overall, um, you know, this study is concluding that the vision transformer is more aligned with human vision. Learning a universal template for few shot data set generalization is aiming to achieve this problem of the meta data set benchmark. So the meta data set is this idea where you have to quickly assemble uh, class labels from a few examples as in few shot learning, except you haven't even seen the data set yet. So the meta data set, uh, I think it descri is described somewhere in this paper, but they have say like this ImageNet, or they have ImageNet, Omniglot, Aircraft, there's these different uh, domains of data sets as well as then quickly assembling to say, uh, label a particular airplane as you know this particular model of it or say assembling these alphabet characters as a new alphabet uh, character in, an, in a vocabulary from the Omniglot and ImageNet and so on. So the, the approach in this paper is to use conditional batch normalization to adjust this universal feature extractor. So they have this feature extractor that is uh, you know a convolutional neural network trained on these data sets or I think it could just be any kind of representation learned from any strategy. And then you try to just slightly have this adaptation to these different problems through the use of conditional batch normalization parameters. And you know, overall, so I think that's the high level overview of the paper. And I haven't really done a full read of this paper, but it looks really interesting and definitely an interesting problem of few shot data set generalization. So next up is Path Dreamer, a world model for indoor navigation. And I haven't really read this paper, but I just think the overall framing of this is incredibly interesting. So you have this input as this uh, 360 degree uh, visual observation that you know 360 degree view of this uh, indoor landscape and they so they describe how they have these 3d point cloud representations of it and they predict the depth in this kind of uh, say like multitask way of mapping out these landscapes and they have these world models that are able to map this out and then do this task of vision language navigation so uh, I, I'm not really sure what I think about this vision language navigation task uh, but it definitely seems to be gaining interest and it's a very interesting domain of aligning vision and language, probably most famously with the Dolly model. But this is even deeper, you know, looking at the 3D point clouds and the depth and the, all this kind of information and then doing this language navigation instructions through these houses. So I don't know too much about this work, but overall I think this is a really exciting kind of high level idea. Also new this week are two really exciting new tutorials on Keras code examples. And I think this is the best place to strengthen uh, your deep learning coding skills. And I've really enjoyed this myself and I hope to see it continue to grow and evolve. So the first of which is image classification with modern MLP models, uh, showing how to implement, say, the GMLP from the pay attention to MLP paper that we looked at earlier, uh, the MLP mixer and this uh, FNet thing with the Fourier transform. I saw something about how this is able to uh, make BERT have, I think, less storage cost and uh, perform the same. But here are the implementations of it in Keras if you're curious about it. And I'll save a full walkthrough for this on the Henry AI Labs Keras code example series that I should be picking up soon, hopefully. And then uh, here is an example of node classification with graph neural networks, showing you how to implement this Quora data set and then of citation networks and then how to implement 
the graph convolutional layer from scratch in Keras to help you work with graph neural networks. I'm really excited about this application of scientific literature mining with deep learning and Google has announced their Biomed Explorer. So this question answering system is built on top of data sets with papers from PubMed, PubMed Central and this Core 19 data set and it's overall using this data set for question answering. So it's a you know, probably a more curated filter data set compared to just say using all the internet to answer these kinds of questions. So you look at questions like what are the side effects of remdesivir in treating COVID-19 or all these different kinds of questions and you can answer it with this uh, system. So overall this way of organizing search systems I think is really interesting on building it on these type of data sets. Also on the topic of new data sets for training natural language processing models, we have BookSum, a collection of data sets for long form narrative summarization. So what we have is three different levels of granularity for summarization, paragraph, chapter, and book level summarizations. And this is used to structure this problem of summarizing these long books and doing this uh, long range attention that we hear so much about when discussing these models and sort of some of the uh, big problems with uh, language data and how you might say need to reference page three paragraph two when you're uh, summarizing these books or summarizing information generally so another interesting data set to help make progress in this area thank you so much for watching the latest ai weekly update from henry ai labs on the week of may 26th 2021 if you want to learn more about any of this content it'll be linked in the description of this video and please subscribe to henry ai labs for more deep learning and ai videos thanks for watching